Vadim's video is still on the web and it's chilling. Sitting cross-legged on a carpet, Gulnara's brother demonstrates how to make a suicide bomb belt. Speaking calmly, as if he's giving a recipe for dinner, he lists the ingredients. They include detergent that you can buy in any supermarket, car battery fluid, and Christmas tree lights for the detonator. Muslims, says Vadim, are being imprisoned, humiliated, and murdered. He calls for jihad, a religious war against the infidel. The most important thing, he says, is to kill as many non-believers as possible. It's incitement to murder like this, which the authorities say prove their rights to be suspicious of radical Islam and to crack down on any hints of extremism. Because this is a battle Moscow believes it cannot afford to lose. Not only if it's to retain control of the North Caucasus, but also if it's to bring security to the whole country. In recent years, different parts of Russia have suffered acts of terror that have been linked to extremists from the Caucasus. I'm driving away from Mahachkala now, heading south into the Caucasus mountains. And it's here that Russia feels least secure and most at risk. That's because the authorities believe that the small towns and villages we're passing now are a hotbed of Islamic fundamentalism. We're just arriving now at the village of Gubden. We tried one entrance into the village that was blocked off and there are troops guarding it. There's also a shot out car there. So now we're trying another way in. Well, we're finally inside Gubden. We found a different checkpoint that was letting cars through. And we're here in what is a very busy mountain village. There are children driving mopeds down narrow, winding streets. And I can see women in headscarves who are gathering water from a well. And high up on a hill overlooking the village, there's the mosque with its green dome and its minarets. It really is a stunning scene. The village and its small white houses seem to grow right out of the rock, out of the Caucasus Mountains themselves. Now, the reason there are checkpoints and police around is that there have been special operations here too. The security forces have clashed here with the so-called Brothers of the Forest, the Islamic insurgents. And what's more, the authorities say that there is a link between this village and two suicide bomb attacks on the Moscow metro earlier this year, which killed 40 people. Police claim that those attacks were organized by a rebel commander from Gubden. In his garden in Gubden, Magomed Said Gajir keeps sheep and chickens. There are fruit trees too, with songbirds on the branches. As we stroll across the grass, 77-year-old Magomed tells me the story of his son, Said Gaji. It's a story which Magomed says shows it's the security forces, not the villagers, who are guilty of violence. One day, Magomed was informed his son had been killed. The police claimed that Saeed Gaji had been helping the brothers of the forest by taking supplies of bread to a rebel hideout and that Saeed Gaji had been shot in a gun battle with the security forces. But Magomed says that according to his information, his son was abducted by the police and tortured to death. Later, his family show me photographs and video of Saeed Gaji's body that have been recorded in the morgue. The corpse is covered in what appear to be knife wounds. <laughs> There was only one bullet hole in his whole body. The rest of his wounds were made by a knife, a dagger. He'd been tortured, sliced up like you'd cut up a pig, and his hands and legs had been broken. What the authorities want all of us to do here is to turn our backs on fundamental Islam. Then they'll leave us in peace. 
but I am a follower of fundamental Islam. I will never turn my back on my faith. Publicly, the Russian authorities praise the work of the security forces. The same week I go to Dagestan, Russia's interior minister, Rashid Nogaliev, pays a visit too. He congratulates officers for cracking down on the rebels. He tells local police they've been carrying out their duties with honor and with dignity. He awards them medals. He makes Dagestan's chief policeman a general. But he makes no mention of what are persistent reports of police brutality. I return to Makhachkala, and I go to see the police captain who'd driven me round. I want to know what he thinks about these allegations against the security forces. The policeman picks up a small book. The title on the front is The Russian Police Law, and he reads out Article 5. According to the law, Russian police are forbidden from using torture or violence or other brutal measures which degrade human dignity. But in the Russian Federation, this point of law is not observed. There are police officers today who don't abide by the law. They act whatever way they want to, even if it means abusing or killing people. And if you turn round to a police chief and say, but what about the Russian constitution? He'll turn to you and say, we've got our own constitution, and we couldn't care less about the constitution of Russia. But why do you think that is? I mean, violence breeds more violence, doesn't it? But the police, but the authorities understand that. If the authorities were really interested in stopping the violence, in restoring order, they would have done it long ago. With the kind of technology we have today, they could easily bring the whole of Dagestan under control using satellites and video cameras. I think the fact that we have religious extremists here is very convenient for the authorities. They use this as a cover to exterminate any opponent. And the whole work of the Dagestani police is designed to protect the illegal actions of the authorities. Those in power don't leave people any choice but to take up arms. There are no decent jobs around. There's corruption everywhere. There's no independent court system. Armed confrontation is the only way people can defend their rights. Later, the police captain and I are joined by two more officers. One of them is the head of the independent trade union of Pakistani policemen. Together, the picture they paint is complex and it's bleak. From the stories they share, I begin to see Dagestan as a dark cocktail of jihad, mafia gangs and local corruption. And often, the lines between religious extremists, local criminals and corrupt officials are blurred. One of the officers tells me that once the police pretended to be Islamic militants so they could extort money from businessmen. Brutality pervades Dagestan. The result is a population which is being radicalized and a police force which is losing control. One of the most radical Islamic militants here was actually the nephew of the police chief of the town of Kaspisk. The son of a police chief in Derbent, he was a brother of the forest too. For a year, he drove the local rebel leader around in his father's police car, transporting weapons, driving rebels to the mountains. Then, there's the case of Colonel Hulataev. He was deputy chief investigator of the Dagestani police force. He was murdered in August. It was his own son who ordered the hit. His son was linked to the extremists. <laughs> At the end of our meeting, 
One of the policemen drives me back to my hotel in the center of Mahachkala. After the dramatic stories I've been hearing, I'm struck once again by how calm, how normal everything looks out of the car window. The traffic, the street lights, the pedestrians hurrying along the wide pavements. It doesn't look like a war zone. I ask the policeman what he thinks will happen in Dagestan. There will be war here. War. Don't expect anything else. It will be the same as it was in Chechnya. No, it will be even worse. The war in Chechnya was simpler. It was a conflict between Russians and Chechens. Dagestan is such a multi-ethnic republic. When it all explodes here, you won't be able to restore peace between all the different peoples of Dagestan. Nobody will know who's fighting who. Not here. It will be a nightmare. The reporter in that edition of Assignment was Steve Rosenberg and the producer Daniel Fisher. The editor is Bridget Harney.